Hello, everybody. I must say it's a real pleasure to be here. When uh, uh, Rich Butman called me, I guess a year ago or so, and asked if I'd be available to come here, uh, and knew that we could work it out during Alumni Weekend, it was just uh, just a pleasure to be able to come and and uh, talk to you. So today, what I'd like to do is uh, talk with you about some of my research. Um, so today, we're going to talk about uh, forgiveness and therapy. Uh, I'm going to focus in on some of the science stuff because that's a lot of what I do, uh, and then the practice of helping clients forgive. Uh, most of my work uh, academically is centered on that intersection. It's really trying to bring uh, the best of empirical science uh, to understanding what really works in, uh, in a real world setting. And so uh, today we'll talk specifically about how that can happen in forgiveness. Um, before I get, get started on, on some of the, the uh, uh, work that I've done and, and some of the work that others have done in this area. I do want to, to acknowledge a few people, uh, some of my faculty collaborators and mentors. Uh, Rich already talked about Everett Worthington. He was my uh, mentor at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, was a really uh, important uh, person in shaping uh, you know, uh, the, the work that I do, both teaching and research. Uh, Mark McMinn, many of you know, uh, Mark McMinn was a professor here in psychology. He came in and was hired. His first year here was my last year here as an undergraduate, and we worked together. Uh, I actually had a, um, there was a program here on Wheaton. I guess they still have it, Dine with a Mind. They still have that. So, uh, you know, basically it's a, for those of you who may not know, uh, opportunity for students to uh, take a faculty member out to lunch for, for free. Um, you just, you know, you could go to the dining hall, but it's all right. And so uh, I actually, here was this new professor and I thought, ah, and I think it was uh, Rich actually brought him into our class that I was taking and, and I thought, ah, I'd take this guy out to lunch and, you know, I just kind of get to know him, welcome him to campus, you know, the, do the right thing, whatever. And uh, at the end of the lunch, he goes, well, I got this research project going and about two years later, that led to my first publication. So uh, dime with the mind. Students out there, do it. It works. Um, but let's back up just a little bit, because really, the person that got me started on this whole academic uh, um, uh, journey, we'll call it, uh, was, was Rich Butman. Uh, and uh, I can remember sitting here somewhere about where you're sitting. Um, my very first semester, it must have been uh, the fall of 1990, uh, I was uh, fairly terrified and, and fairly uh, undecided freshman, but I knew psychology was pretty interesting. So I came and I took Psych 101. I sat here and, uh, you know, and I, I took notes for the first day. And then uh, pretty much after that, I started, you know, getting more interested in, you know, going out and hanging out and on Blanchard Lawn and going to the dining hall early and things like that. But, you know, I tried to come. And uh, by the end of the semester, though, because we did things that I'm maybe not as interested in in psych, and I didn't really understand that you, you eventually specialize in one of the areas, I was like, psych, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, like, study rats and, like, brain pathways, and I'm just not interested in that. So I actually went and became a communications major for a while and decided I was going to, you know, be a movie director and had all these great plans and actually did the, you know, freshman class film and I was the director of that and it was a terrible film, but, you know, we had fun and, you know, eventually, I, you know, reality started to set in by the time I was a junior. And so by the time I was a junior, I had pretty much exhausted all my gen eds. Uh, rocks for jocks and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so I was like, well, you know, what am I going to do? Well, i got to give psych another chance because this other stuff's not working out. So I look through the catalog and I find this class called Abnormal Psych. And I remember from 101 and reading the text that, you know, that was, that was a pretty cool class. You know, that was a pretty cool area, you know, this abnormal psychology stuff and kind of counseling clinical. And, yeah, all right, well, I'll give it a shot. Rich Butman, all right, well, you know, give it a shot. Well, what are you going to do? So I went and took this class. On the first day of class, Rich, I don't know if you still do this or if you teach the same class still, but first day of class when I was there, he hands out Scott Peck's first chapter. The very first sentence is, life is difficult. And discuss. No syllabus, no, hi, how are you? Welcome back. How was your summer vacation? No, life is difficult. Here, discuss. And that hit me so powerfully um, and really hit at you know, my soul, I mean, because of where I had come from. It just resonated. Yes, life is difficult. There are difficult elements. And so I thought, oh, this is a class that I might be able to, to really get into. Well, Rich Butman has these uh, infamous reaction papers. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, since I was really into the class, 
By the time September 22nd came up and I needed to turn this paper in, now you're asking, how did I know that? Well, I know that because I actually pulled up my old reaction paper that was actually typed, typed, not, you know, word processed, typed, September 22nd. Don't steal my uh, student ID number there. But I want to show you what Rich did for me and for many of his other students. These are the types of comments that would stand out. Absolutely, he put smiley faces on there. Um, live it, good personal ownership. And the one that I love the most, no doubt, no doubt. And I could just hear his intensity in those comments to me. And this said to me, you know what? Like, I can do this, I can do psychology. So I really owe a debt to you, Rich, and to that class and to the other classes that I took with Rich later in my career here. And that really started, like I said, it was my junior year. The next two years for me were very uh, intense. They were very focused on uh, the scholarship. And I really felt a blossoming, a, a kind of a coming into my own, uh, the passion for this discipline. Um, and I, I have much to owe to Rich and to the department uh, and to Wheaton College for that. Okay, um, I also do want to acknowledge too, currently I have a set of graduate students who are phenomenal, um, two of whom are on internship right now, and the, the Julia and Dan, Grace and Brian and Marilyn are just fabulous graduate students. Um, I would not be nearly as productive uh, if it wasn't for them and for the work that they do. Um, so I've been very blessed with uh, some wonderful graduate students, undergraduate RAs, um, who also do research credits with me and have been, been just uh, phenomenal in the work that they've done as well. And then lastly, and I will get to the research stuff, I promise. Um, lastly, I really want to uh, acknowledge my wife and family. So I gave you a picture so you know a little bit more about me. Um, this is my wife, Elizabeth, and my son, Skylar, and daughter, uh, Madeline. Um, these aren't my two girls, like most people think. We just, we just like his hair long because it's curly and cute. So, um, But really, I, I always want to say in groups, I feel like this is my opportunity to say the thank you to my wife, and I wish she was here. Um, there's really very few days that go by that I don't acknowledge the fact that I can go to work for 40 plus hours a week and know that someone's taking care of my kids and I have the opportunity to have a family at the same time that I have a career. And I wouldn't be able to do that without uh, the work that she puts in, not only in just taking care of them, but in taking care of our whole family and household. So that's an important acknowledgement to me. Okay, so to the presentation. Give you a little overview about what I'd like to do in our time together. Um, I want to talk first about what is forgiveness. It's an important topic uh, to address, just defining what forgiveness is before we get uh, digging into you know, what the research might say. Um, then we'll talk about specifically forgiveness therapy. I wanna define forgiveness therapy and then talk about some of the research uh, that I've done in that area. And then I wanted to sum it up a little bit um, with uh, kind of the state of the knowledge. And so I thought what I do there is really try and bring it you know, out of the academic journals and really more into, okay, well what, can we distill it down to just some things that we know and some things that we don't know? And we'll close with that. Um, down here on the bar, some of you in the back might be able to see it, I'm not sure if you can. You know those little status bars when you're downloading a big file? I just thought, you know, you guys deserve that. So you know where I'm at in my talk, okay? So there's button number one, and it's gonna grow each slide, okay? So you have a sense of like, if you're nodding off, you can look up and you say, oh, all right, we're almost there, I can really make it, okay? Just so you have an idea. All right, so let's get started. All right, so um, forgiveness research. Uh, the scope of the research um, is just amazing to me. I uh, was invited to do a chapter uh, by my uh, graduate school advisor, Everett Worthington, uh, in the Handbook of Forgiveness and that was published in 2005. And in that book, in the handbook, there's research in there that spans forgiveness research, and we'll put forgiveness maybe in quotes, uh, with primates all the way up to uh, survivors of genocide and dealing with that. And everywhere in between, there's, uh, so there's forgiveness research that currently exists uh, looking at just small groups, looking at individuals and in romantic relationships, looking at these more severe kinds of hurts like genocide or others like abuse, incest, those sorts of things. Uh, and then other, uh, there's, uh, research done on kind of neuroimaging of forgiveness. So at this point, the forgiveness uh, research, uh, the scope of the research is just huge. 
Um, and this growth has happened really recently. So for those of you who may not have been aware of this area, it's a significant uh, uh, growth area just in the last really 15 to 20 years. So in 1997, this is a count, I don't take credit for this count, this is uh, uh, Everett Worthington's count, but I steal it here for today for uh, illustration purposes. He counts about 60 articles in 1997, which actually was part of that explosion. You know, so it started around 1990, 92, and uh, really exploded into 60. Well, then that turned into 1,000 less than 10 years later. Uh, and now, just two years later, uh, or four years later, there's up to 1,200, or over that probably now, because I think this count was about a year old. Um, so this is a significant area that has just, like I said, exploded. Uh, and you can find it in social psych, developmental psych, clinical counseling psych, uh, pretty much any area of psychology. There are forgiveness studies being done. Um, and it's really, really broadened our understanding. So what is this thing called forgiveness? You know, to conceptualize forgiveness for research purposes, you know, if we could, we could you know, if we had the time, we'd go around and have everybody say, well, what do you think forgiveness is, or write it down. Um, we'd probably get a bunch of different, uh, you know, answers, but pretty much it would start to converge. And there's been some research actually on that to show that, you know, kind of what everyday people think of forgiveness. Um, and it tends to include things like, uh, uh, you know, overlooking a hurt or, you know, getting beyond a hurt or um, other elements that we would probably say, yeah, that kind of makes sense with forgiveness. But when you want to study something, um, you need to really come up with a, as good a definition of it as you can uh, in order to really conceptualize it and to study it. So um, definitions are key uh, to do that. So I want to give you kind of a broadish kind of definition. This isn't quite how we conceptualize it, but pretty close. This is kind of the theory or where our understanding of forgiveness comes from. So we would talk about forgiveness as being the reduction in anger, bitterness, desires to seek revenge, that is accompanied by the promotion of pro-social attitudes and feelings about the offending person. Now, I come from, I am trained as a counseling psychologist, so I come from a uh, counseling perspective, a uh, clinical perspective. I'm interested in how forgiveness plays out in therapy, specifically. Uh, if I were to have a social psychologist friend up here, he would probably want to argue with me about my understanding of forgiveness, because it would be different. It depends uh, in the setting that you're talking about, especially when we start to get down to conceptualizing these. So for me, I'm very interested in, and I'll give you a little background on this. Um, when I was uh, probably, I was a pretty new assistant professor at Iowa State, and um, the chair, or the, the head of our program, uh, Doug Epperson, who had been at Iowa State probably as long as I had been alive at that point, um, you know, we're at a lunch, a faculty lunch, and there was actually a guest there, which really made it uncomfortable. But he basically took me to task. He said, okay, so you do this forgiveness research stuff, right? Well. How is that any different than what therapists have been doing forever? You know, they, they've been working on helping people to like reduce anger and get over their bitter, bitterness as long as there's been counseling. Like, what do you do that's different? And I brought him right back to this. Forgiveness therapy or forgiveness research that I'm doing is really, it's more about, it's more than just reducing the bitterness, that there's something more. So reducing bitterness is great, and dealing with revenge and helping people to cope with anger, or manage their anger, that's all great and really important things to do. Uh, and I'm glad that there's many therapists doing that. But I, what I'm studying is, what can you do in therapy to take it the next step? So that it's not just about managing one's anger, but it's actually about promoting more pro-social attitudes and feelings about the offending person, really getting at and now that there's positive psychology, I can say this, the virtue of forgiveness. So really talking about more of a, a virtue um, in therapy. I also defined it uh, in a paper that I published with some graduate students back in 2005 uh, this way. Um, replacing the bitter, angry feelings of vengefulness, often resulting from a hurt, with positive feelings of goodwill toward the offender, and this is the important part for clinical uh, work, without giving up appropriate physical and or emotional boundaries, that provides safety from hurtful people. And so this is another really important component of that uh, definition and conceptualization so that we're not just dealing with uh, you know, um, encouraging people to go back 
to the offender, especially when that person is not remorseful or that person uh, uh, is still likely to hurt you in very significant ways again. And so we want to be able to still talk about forgiveness without encouraging people to go back to hurtful people. And, and so this is how we think about forgiveness from more of a, a clinical perspective. Okay. Uh, if you, has anybody read any stuff on forgiveness? How many people? A few people. Okay, good. All right, so my stuff won't be completely, will be a little new, which is good. But uh, for those of you who read it, you've probably come across this uh, whole idea here of what forgiveness is not. It seems like that's where most people start. They'll say, well, let's see, what is forgiveness? Well, I know it's not this, I know it's not that. So I tried to give you what it was first, but it's also important to look at what uh, things forgiveness is not, so that just so we can kind of be clear about what we're talking about. So one of the first things that I did, and this is some of the work that I did in graduate school, we uh, struggled with this idea of, okay, well, is forgiveness just reducing unforgiveness? Or in other words, is forgiveness just simply when someone gets over their anger? You know, so they get, kind of their anger goes down, they've forgiven. Is that true or not? Well, our theory and our definition was, no, that's not the case. That's not really forgiveness. And so uh, what I did is I ran a study um, to try and get at this whole idea of what might really be happening for people. Um, and so if you will, you could imagine two categories, and of course, life doesn't really work in categories, but researchers like me have to do this. So let's just imagine, uh, suspend reality for a moment with me, and let's just say that unforgiveness is in two categories, yes or no. And then let's put forgiveness in two categories, yes or no, okay? Now, of course, if Forgiveness was just reducing unforgiveness. Then we could imagine a scenario where someone would be really unforgiving. I'm really going to get that guy. And there's no forgiveness, right? Of course, those go together. That makes sense. Well, you could imagine a situation where someone would be like, no, I've forgiven that. I've moved on. I've gotten beyond that. Well, I don't really have any more revenge and bitterness. Of course, that, that goes with it, right? OK, so those two would fit. But what about this? There shouldn't be this category if these two are the same thing or, or polar opposites. So there should not be a situation where someone says, no, I don't really have any unforgiveness. I don't really. Well, then if they don't have unforgiveness, they should be forgiving, right? Well, what if there's people that say, no, I haven't forgiven that person, but I'm not particularly angry, I'm not particularly vengeful, and that sort of thing. And of course, this last category up here with the X, we would assume that there would be nobody who would say, no, I'm totally forgiving. Boy, I'm going to get that guy, right? Either that or there's something going on there. They're not telling us right, or they you know, maybe need some more uh, psychotherapy and some medication. So we tested this to see what, what would people do. And so what we did is we actually had two different measures. One measure was uh, a measure of revenge motivations, desires to avoid the person. Uh, it's a scale called the trim. Uh, and uh, we had people fill that out. And then we also had people fill out, we said, if this is what forgiveness is, give us on a scale of one to five how much forgiveness you've had of this person. And so when we plotted this data, you can see zero, one, three, and four, so I skipped the middle point of the forgiveness scale along the bottom here. Um, but the two categories of people that said, you know, no, I don't have any forgiveness, and then you got the two higher categories of people that said, yes, I am forgiving. And then it's on this category here with unforgiveness. What you see is up in the X box, there's really nobody up there. There's nobody saying, high revenge, high avoidance, I really want to get this guy. Oh, yes, and I'm very much forgiven. But you do have a few people, not many, and in fact, mostly it's a linear relationship, but, but there are a few people who say, you know what, I have forgiven. Uh, I have reduced this unforgiveness, but I have not forgiven. So they're in this kind of no-no category. Um, so some preliminary evidence, anyway, that uh, it seems that forgiveness is not just reducing unforgiveness. And from this data, we go on to argue some other things, like, well, what could people do to deal with their unforgiveness? Well, there's a lot of things that we find people do. You could do, you could seek justice. So you might go to the courts, and you might uh, sit in and, and watch the person who offended you, uh, you know, if it was a criminal kind of offense. You might sit in through the whole thing and wait and wait till the, finally the judge says, here's your sentence and you're in jail. And okay, I don't feel quite as vengeful anymore. I'm not forgiving. But I've dealt with some of that by watching this justice. Or it could be other kinds of things. It could be family justice, you know, going back to the family matriarch and saying, this is what happened. And, you know, and they pulls them in. There's this whole thing. Uh, it could be divine justice. You know, I, I, I don't really feel that angry. I'm going to leave it to God. I don't really have a whole lot of forgiveness towards this person, but 
I know God will deal with them the way God needs to. Um, and there's many other ways that people deal with it. Denial, uh, you know, we can just go on and on. Um, so, I hope I've convinced you that uh, forgiveness is not just reducing unforgiveness. Okay, so what else is it not? It is not condoning. This is crucial uh, in many situations, especially clinical situations. It's not saying that the offense was okay. It's not okay at all. In fact, that if you really are truly forgiving, then your first step, and Lou Smeads talks about this in his books on forgiveness, and many researchers also uh, support this uh, work, that if you say that I'm forgiving, well, your first step is you gotta say there's something I gotta forgive. So in other words, you have to blame first. You have to say there's something wrong here. And so it's not condoning. It's not saying it was okay. Because if you're saying it's okay, well, then there's really nothing to forgive. So it's not really forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is not forgetting. And so this is a big one. Man, I can remember a group that I worked with. Uh, it's been a few years now, uh, specifically around doing a forgiveness therapy group. And uh, people dealt with some pretty significant things in that group, uh, from some family abuse to uh, you know, being frauded out of you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And, and one of the things that we talked about early on in the group is, we're going to work towards forgiveness. But remember, forgiveness is not forgetting. And they're like, what? It's like, oh, forgiveness is not forgetting. What do you mean? Oh, well, let me tell you. You are probably going to remember this the rest of your life. If you have had a significant hurt that's going to bring you to therapy for it, you're not going to forget it. In fact, it's probably potentially going to be a pivotal point in your life. And it might be something you want to remember as a time when you made a significant growth or you moved beyond it or you found courage or something like that that you hadn't had before. And so we talk a lot about the fact that forgiveness does not necessarily mean forgetting. Now, if people forgive and they are able to forget, great. But in the work that I do, typically, again, being in a clinical kind of setting, the people that we're going to be working with are not going to be forgetting the kinds of things that are going to bring them to therapy that they want to work on. And so despite what we say to each other or to our kids, I don't think I've said this yet to my kids, but I might. Forgive and forget. Um, you know, we say that a lot. Well, really what we mean is kind of like, don't hold that over the person's head, right? We don't really mean forget it in the sense of have no memory for it anymore. And this is the last big one, and many of you who may have heard forgiveness talks before, done some of the reading on forgiveness, uh, have hopefully come across this, because this is a crucial one as well, that forgiveness is not reconciling. So it's not the same thing to say, uh, I've forgiven, as it is to say, I'm willing to trust you again and to get back into a relationship with you. Now, the everyday kinds of forgiveness stuff that we do often goes hand in hand with reconciliation. You know, so if I get upset with my wife because she, I think she's done something to me, and, you know, and usually it's the other way around, but um, you know, just for illustrative purposes, so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so, so I'm upset and I might just not even want to be close and I don't want to sit on the couch with her and I just am, you know, I'm not looking at her. But then finally I'm like, okay, so this is what you did to me. And she's like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Oh, wow. oh, you, did, oh you meant that. Oh, okay. And then whew, kind of this rush of forgiveness. It's fine. Okay. All right. I understand. And automatically the trust is restored. We're back and it's like we don't even have to say, so are we good again? Well, sometimes we do. But most of the time it's just automatic, right? So in these everyday kinds of hurts, this reconciling is a part of forgiveness. But when we do the research and we talk about forgiveness, what is forgiveness, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to reconcile. So imagine a situation where someone has been, uh, you know, and it kind of the quintessential example of this is the uh, spouse abuse. So a woman comes to therapy uh, and has been abused by her spouse physically, uh, maybe just emotionally. Either way, it's, it's uh, uh, rough difficult things to overcome. And so they're working on this with a therapist. Well, you would never want to put someone back into a relationship where the person is still hitting them. I mean, you got to keep them physically safe. Um, and so in the work that we do, we still want to be able to talk about forgiveness with this person. Why would we want to shut off the benefits that forgiveness can provide to people? And I'm not going to go over that research, but there's a lot of research that shows some pretty significant benefits for the forgiver. Um, why would we want to shut that person off from that when they can benefit from that, but we don't want them, obviously, to go back into a hurtful situation, into a situation where the person can't be, can't be trusted to be safe? And so there's some other work, kind of additional work that needs to be done in some situations beyond the forgiveness. And that we would talk about more in terms of reconciling with this person. And that, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, has to do with more about trust. The forgiveness that I research, or the, the way I conceptualize forgiveness, is really inside the person. It's an internal kind of work. 
This reconciling is the interpersonal work. It's, can I trust you again? Uh, let's talk about this event. Have I received an apology from you that seems heartfelt? That, is there a change in your behavior, a real uh, repentance in what you've done? Or are you basically going to be doing the same thing to me again? And so that's a crucial thing for many, many clients. That group that I talked to you guys about a few minutes ago, when we got to this topic, I mean, they thought the forgetting thing was important. When I got to this topic, they just really, I mean, many of them after the group wrote in and said, that was one of the most important things for me that helped me to move forward. It's because I've been holding on to my anger. Why? Because I had to keep myself safe. And so many people want to hold on to their anger or feel they need to hold on to their anger just to keep themselves safe. Because if I let go of my anger, what's going to happen? Well, I forgive, and then I have to go back with this person, and I know that's not smart. So what, what, what else do I have? What other option do I have? I have to hold on to my uh, anger in order to keep myself safe. So when we separate those two things out, that really helps people to kind of free them up and, and help them to think, OK, all right, yeah, I can do forgiveness. I can move towards forgiving res uh, resolution, but I can leave reconciling for another day. OK. So then this brings us more to the, the work that I focused on over the last five to seven years and uh, really talking, really exploring uh, this whole idea of forgiveness in therapy and, and what happens in, in therapy. So what is forgiveness therapy? Let's see, I'll give you a definition here real quick. So I'm thinking of forgiveness therapy and as I talk to you today, it'll be in this way, that it's a psychotherapy, uh, it's psychotherapy or counseling that seeks to help individuals cope with and resolve a past offense or hurt by alleviating the constellation of negative symptoms and helping them to think and feel more positively about the event and or the offender. So again, back to that definition way of thinking about forgiveness, but it's this counseling and therapy that's focused on that. Okay, so some examples. Well, there's a lot of forgiveness therapy now that has actually been uh, developed and actually researched. So I have to admit, I'm probably a little, uh, let's see, the literature that I'm exposed to mostly is uh, the empirical literature. So there's forgiveness therapy that's been out there and great stuff that's been done for a long time. It's just that people haven't been studying it. So it's people who will do it with their clients and then they'll write up what they do. It's useful, it's wonderful, it's just not where I go. So most of the stuff that I look at is actually when people create an intervention and then they test it in a, what's called a clinical trial or in some sort of pilot study um, and do it in more of an empirical way. But, so I give you that just to let you know kind of my bias perhaps, um, but there's wonderful stuff that's been out there and out there since probably as early as the 80s or even, even earlier than that. Um, but in terms of what's been studied, there's individual programs that have been studied, group programs, which is primarily my area. I do a lot of like uh, group counseling, group therapy studies. Uh, there's some wonderful packages that have been put together for uh, forgiveness treatment uh, for couples, marital couples. And, uh, um, one that's been done, uh, actually I think there's more than one now, but uh, one that I know of that's been studied that's specifically for infidelity uh, and helping uh, married couples to deal with sexual infidelity and uh, moving past that and forgiving that. Uh, and then there's even some uh, uh, studies that have been done on treatments it more a, uh, within a culture or between cultures. Uh, that have been done more community-based kinds of uh, interventions have been really powerful. So uh, some of this has been done in Northern Ireland, some in South Africa, some in Rwanda. Um, the one in Rwanda is just, you know, so powerful. Um, Urban Staub went in there uh, with a grant actually in the, in the 90s and uh, worked with uh, uh, community leaders in Rwanda who then community members and community leaders actually ran community-based interventions uh, and uh, worked with people around the, the genocide from the 90s and um, showed some really powerful, I mean, it's the one, of, it's, it's, you know, when I read it, I don't know how you would be, when I read it, I, maybe it's that skeptical side of me, but I'm kind of like, really? Like, man, how do you, I mean, that's brave to go in there and start talking about forgiveness? And sure enough, like the numbers, you know, the, the people that, not only the, the data, but also people writing in about their responses to this treatment is, is powerful, powerful stuff. So, you know, as you think about forgiveness in therapy, um, another way that I might dichotomize it or categorize it for you to help you to understand what's out there is to think of this in this way, um, implicit versus explicit models. Uh, so I've talked a lot today about these, uh, uh, what I'm going to call explicit models. 
where people actually put together a specific treatment with the, the primary intent of uh, having clients achieve forgiveness. But, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, there's been a lot of therapy to help people to deal with past hurts. And there are some that are more what I would call implicit models uh, that are really built into a broader treatment approach. So you might have a, uh, a treatment approach that deals with uh, social anxiety, maybe, and part of that has a forgiveness component. Or it might be dealing with depression, and part of it has kind of forgiveness worked into that. Or uh, maybe more along the lines of like a, a post-traumatic stress disorder uh, treatment. And then in that, it deals with forgiveness. Again, most of the stuff that I've looked at, most of the research that I've done has been on these explicit models. So people who are actually trying to put together programs for individuals who say, I've been hurt, and I want to get beyond this. And, uh, and so, these models are the ones that we tend to uh, look at in my research. Okay, uh, so who do we look at? Who do we study? And this is another really important thing for those of you who are uh, clinicians or, or students who are uh, studying to be uh, counselors or want to be counselors. Um, it's important to know when you look at clinical research, who are they studying? It's very important. So. Again, this is a bit of uh, just to let you know where I'm coming from and some of the bias that, that are inherent in the sample that I use. So we look at individuals who have been hurt by another person in a significant way. You know, these aren't typically, well, and actually I shouldn't say that. I did one study not too long ago, which is going to have a whole lot of trouble being uh, published, um, that we uh, looked at individuals and um, we had, I mean, how much time do I have? Yeah, okay. I'll tell you a story. Um, this is a really sad story for me as a researcher, but I'm gonna share it anyway, um, let you know some of the struggles of researching. So I ran uh, probably close to, um, I didn't run them, I had people, therapists run, I think we had over 20 separate groups. We had close to 200 people, it was probably like 175 people that we ran through this uh, study. We got a grant and we ran people through it. Um, the thing was is the grant wasn't very much money, and we didn't have a lot of access to uh, people in the community, so what we did is we opened it up to the, the uh, undergraduate students at ISU, and that was our primary focus. Well, we had a lot of people sign up. Um, we had enough money that undergraduate students were like, yeah, I'll go to that. The drawback was is they were just going either for the kind of curiosity or for the money and not so much for the hurt. Now, some people were. There were some people in there that had some very significant hurts. So obviously college students are people too. I was a college student once. They get hurt just like everybody else gets hurt. Unfortunately, there were also people that were involved in the study that uh, you know, didn't have quite the level of hurt that uh, other people did. Some people you know, dealt with, uh, I remember reading one where the guy was kind of like, you're not gonna just see him filling out the questionnaire where he's like, I know I'm gonna get 15 bucks for filling this out. Now it says hurt. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, in ninth grade, the coach didn't play me on a basketball game. And I thought, you know, I guess for somebody who's really into sports, that could be a significant hurt, but my thought was probably not. And so what we ended up finding was that, of course, everybody gets better. It didn't matter, you know, the, uh, the, and I'm gonna walk you through the kind of research that I do so that you'll actually see, um, you know, the, the different conditions, but at this point, we had two conditions that were treatment and one that was no treatment. And so it's supposed to look like this on a graph. You start at uh, no forgiveness and you get better, right? In the treatment group, and then the people that aren't treated are supposed to do what? Stay down here, right? Well, they didn't, of course. They all got better. And so basically that tells us time heals all wounds, but our research doesn't and our research program doesn't, and so uh, it's gonna be hard to get that one published. But I won't talk about that one today. I'll talk about the ones that were published and that were better. Okay, so serious hurt is an important thing in order to get uh, uh, this forgiveness treatment. Um, people that wanna get past the hurt. So there's people that are hurt that uh, actually have come into our studies and have said, yeah, I've been hurt. And uh, actually uh, my graduate student, one of my graduate students just screened somebody two weeks ago for a study we're currently doing. And uh, he said, you know, he was telling me about it. And he said, yeah, this guy is really, he's, his hurt is really eligible. Like he's, he's really upset with Iowa State. Um, and Iowa State and, you know, basically passed him over for a promotion. And because of that, he was really angry. And so as a result, he didn't, uh, he took retirement about 10, minute, 10 years early. And of course, with the economy and everything else, he's in a really bad financial situation right now. And, uh, and so he's carrying all this bitterness. And, and my graduate student, Brian, said, well, he said, oh, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. He said, is this something that you want to forgive? And he says, 
No, I don't want to get over this. He said, the only way I'm going to get over this and let go of my anger is if they pay me all the money that I didn't get over the last 10 years because I had to retire early. So we thought, all right, this is probably not the place for you, but we can get you to another place where you can work on other things if you want. Um, maybe a lawyer or something like that. I don't know. But, um, you know, so it's important in our work that people have at least a willingness to uh, want to get past the hurt. Um, typically, people have had trouble getting past the hurt. Uh, maybe some of you have been through some pretty significant things in your life. Maybe some of you know people who have been. And people are, for the most part, fairly resilient. Um, you know, I certainly know people. I've been through some really difficult things. Um, that hasn't necessarily warranted, like, a, a full-on psychological intervention or psychotherapy. Um, maybe some help with friends, whatever, and able to move on. Well, these are individuals who have tried. They want to get beyond this, and they haven't been able to. And for the most part, these are people that are open to exploring forgiveness. Although, one of the things that I should say is it's not everybody will say, uh, yeah, I definitely want to forgive. They're just at least open to the idea. Um, that uh, some of them aren't necessarily, they just kind of want to over, overcome the pain or, or stop ruminating about it. Um, but at least they're, they're willing to explore this idea as a possibility. So these are the people that we work with. OK. So does it work? Well, I probably wouldn't be here if it didn't work a little bit. Um, it does work. Uh, we published a study, a meta-analysis, which is basically a way of organizing uh, a bunch of uh, other studies. And so we uh, uh, ran, ran some analyses on uh, previous interventions. And what we found was uh, 40 different treatment conditions over, I think it was like 30 different studies, 25 to 30 separate studies. We found 40 different treatment conditions, 16 uh, no treatment conditions. So basically, uh, we had data on that. And uh, we were able then to categorize the treatments, these 40 active treatments, into either an explicit forgiveness model or some sort of alternative treatment. To give you an example, an alternative treatment might be a forgiveness treatment that pulls out all of the uh, theoretically important components. Right? So you, you talk about forgiveness, and you do a, but you don't do the main interventions. Um, other alternative treatments are uh, groups, support groups, where you get people together and you have them talk about their problems, but the counselor is only supposed to basically give them support and say, wow, that, you know, that's tough, and let's talk about that, but not really do any kind of explicit interventions. Okay? So that's the alternative treatment condition. And then we had uh, several, like I said up there, 16 no treatment, where it's either that they're waiting for treatment, a wait list condition, or uh, they were uh, in some studies, I think there were a few studies where, in fact, they just they didn't get treatment. They were randomly assigned to no treatment. OK, so what we found in our results when we uh, compiled all these studies that had been done on forgiveness specifically, we found that uh, the forgiveness studies actually had the greatest effect. Okay? So the ES up there stands for effect size. Uh, a 0.57 isn't outrageous, but that's kind of a moderate effect size um, for the way we were measuring it. And uh, so from pre to post, people were getting better in the forgiveness treatments. Uh, in the alternative treatments, people got a little bit better. Um, but they did not get as much better as the uh, uh, alternative or as the uh, forgiveness. And then, of course, in the no treatment, that 0.10 is small, non you know, it's insignificant effect, really. Um, people are pretty much staying the same when they're not being treated on average, unlike that one study I just told you about where everybody got better. Um, OK, and so then what you can do, we did, is we can actually compare these different conditions. And we found that, in fact, the explicit forgiveness treatments seem to be most effective for helping people to promote forgiveness more than the alternative treatments were. Although in the alternative treatments, people were moving towards forgiveness at least a little bit. Well, that sounds you know, pretty interesting. And, and I think uh, you could say, well, great. Well, then let's go out and do these forgiveness treatments, tell therapists, train them on how to do specific forgiveness. And I say, and this is where my, a lot of my work over the last couple of years comes in, wait a minute. Hold on just a second. Uh, there are some real limitations with the alternative treatments. So when I dug in deeper and tried to say, okay, well, what were people really doing in these alternative treatments? Uh, what I found is that, in fact, most of them were not uh, true treatments. So most of them were, well, for one example, one was a discussion group. So they, uh, in one study, they studied elderly women, uh, and uh, they had them kind of doing life review and thinking about, well, is there a time from your past, you know, from your past that you want to forgive someone? 
And uh, the people that participated said, yes, there was. And half the group went into a discussion group. And in that discussion group, they just had them talk about current events. And I said, wow, well, what's going on? What's the head headlines, you know, this, that. Had them chit chat, had them talk. I mean, that's nice, but it's, it's not therapeutic. You know, it's at least most of us therapists, and I know the, the site program isn't, master's program isn't training people to do this. Um, there probably are some therapists out there that do this though. So, and if you run into them, Go find a new therapist. Um, basically, a discussion group isn't therapeutic. It's not intended to be. Um, it really was more like a placebo treatment. Um, and that's what many of the alternative treatments were. And so I thought, well, OK, duh. That's no big deal. You could put on, almost put in any therapeutic. It didn't have to be a forgiveness treatment. What if we did some solid CBT with these people? Didn't even really do any explicit stuff, but actually did a real bona fide psychotherapy with them. They probably would have gotten better than the alternative treatment as well. So that's where uh, I started asking these questions. Okay, well, what about true alternative studies that use true bona fide psychotherapy alternatives? What happens then? Well, I found four. Well, I found two, and I did two. So uh, those that found a difference, so that the forgiveness was, the specific forgiveness treatment was actually better than the alternative, were two studies uh, that, and both of these actually come out of a, a lab uh, run by a, another major uh, forgiveness researcher at uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Bob Enright, who's done really some seminal work in forgiveness treatment. Um, and so both of these come out of his lab. Um, one, the first one, Lynn et al., was done with uh, uh, individuals in inpatient for substance abuse. And as part of their substance abuse treatment, they were uh, asked to identify a time when someone had hurt them. And then they either, on the one hand, worked through the, the hurt with the, the forgiveness program, Enright's forgiveness program, or on the other hand, uh, they were put into a group where they just did the typical, psycho, uh, typical drug and alcohol treatment. Okay, so this was actually the treatment that they use in this inpatient place. So it's not just a you know, discussion group. This is a real, real counseling program. Uh, and they found actually that people in the forgiveness group not only did better for uh, forgiving, they also were less depressed, I think they were less anxious, and the most important thing was, which I thought kind of astounding, they actually did better on their drug relapse. So there's something about the, they argue, that there's something about the forgiveness treatment that's better than typical drug and alcohol counseling for helping people to get past uh, drug and alcohol use. Um, before I go on, the second one, Reed and Enright, they worked with individuals, women, who had been in an emotionally abusive relationship. And they put people through either the uh, forgiveness program or what they called a kind of treatment as usual for emotional abuse of women, dealing with uh, helping them to express what they had gone through, building some assertiveness skills, uh, those sort of things. And they found pretty much the same results, that people in the forgiveness treatment did better. Well, I think that's really intriguing, but the two studies that I ran didn't find that. In fact, the studies that I ran, uh, we both published these in, 90, in uh, 2009, but uh, that was more because one journal held up that first study there for about five years, if you can believe it. Um, so these were done you know, five to seven years ago. And uh, in each of my studies, basically what I found was that individuals in the forgiveness treatment and in the alternative treatments, they did very similarly. So in the first one, we ran uh, one of those studies where we had the, the full forgiveness treatment, and then we broke it out. We pulled out one of the, the primary theoretically uh, relevant parts of the intervention, and we ran that as a treatment comparison group. And then we also had a stress reduction group. So we talked with them about deep muscle relaxation and had them just practice it and practice it and, and uh, do a lot of relaxation skills. And then we related that to the hurt, that a hurt can often cause stress and pain, and, and that one way you can deal with it is through relaxing. And all three groups got better to the same degree. With Wade and Meyer uh, in 09, we uh, brought in people and we compared the forgiveness treatment to uh, what's sometimes called uh, process group therapy. Um, and so we worked on that and they were both short-term groups. Um, and actually I have some more details on this one that I can give you. Um, so what we did is we brought people in. This was a pilot study, so it was a really small N, but uh, we compared this forgiveness treatment to process therapy um, and it was short-term. Process-oriented group counseling, for those who may not be familiar with it, um, this is one of my real passions, so I'll have to be careful on the time on this one. Um, 
Process-oriented group counseling, one of the things that I love about it is it gives people an opportunity to actually practice right in the moment. And if the therapist is on their toes, typically a co-therapist are on their toes, they can actually help people right in the here and now. So um, it's not just about talking about my problems from my past life or this past week, but it's about kind of being who I am. And then as I am who I am, the therapist kind of stops or freezes the action and says, what just happened there? Let's go back. Let's talk about that. So, uh, you know, maybe, I mean, this isn't true of me, but maybe I talk a lot in social situations. I mean, it's definitely not true. I'm a real quiet person. But uh, say I talked a lot in social situations, so much so that people were really getting to the place where they were withdrawing from me. Because they're like, anytime I go around that Nathaniel guy, he's like talking all the time and I just can't handle it. So, yeah, I'll be nice to him, but I'm not going to be close to him because I never get to talk about myself. Well, what would happen to me? over 5, 10, 25 years. I'd be pretty isolated, most likely. So if I go to a group therapy, then, what, I, what, what do you think I would do? I'd be who I was. So I'd talk a lot and blah, blah, blah. And what would happen? The group would slowly you know, pull away from me, and they'd kind of scooch their chairs this way, and they'd talk over here and make sure they didn't make eye contact with me, because they might be afraid I'd jump in and say something. right? That's where the therapist jumps in and says, there's something going on here. Let's talk about it. It would give me the opportunity then to really explore and understand what's happening in my life and be able to make some really powerful connections. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful therapy. Um, it, it's, there's a lot going on. With, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, so uh, what we did is we used that model to compare with the forgiveness treatment. And what we found was this. So we have the forgiveness group, we had 11 people, we have uh, the process group, we have nine people in the waitlist group, we had eight. The waitlist group, well first let's compare uh, the, uh, on desires for revenge against the person who hurt them. You can see the effect sizes are fairly comparable with a small sample like this. We can't really tell whether the 0.52 is uh, you know, significantly less than the 0.72. Um, and so we leave that up in the air a little bit. But for the most part it seems like people are getting better. There's a reduction in revenge, whether you're in the process group dealing with not really talking specifically about forgiveness or whether you're actually getting all of these kind of interventions specifically to promote forgiveness. And you can see here the 0.02 is basically no change uh, in the uh, waitlist group. So over the same amount of time, the people who did not receive treatment, who were waiting for treatment, uh, did not get better on the revenge. And then you see here, this is uh, BSI, stands for a Brief Symptom Inventory. It's basically just a checklist of uh, a rating form of different psychological uh, symptoms, depression types, anxiety type symptoms, and others. And here you see a reduction. Again, they're pretty similar, a 0 0.70 and a 0.97. In this case, with such a small number, pretty similar. Um, they're both getting better. They're reducing psychological symptoms as a part of being in this treatment. And you can see here with a 0.13, again, very little, really no change in the waitlist group. So this really brings up the question, at least it does in my mind, and maybe it does in yours, why the discrepancy among these studies? Why is it that there's two studies that uh, are showing there's forgiveness is better even for helping people reduce drug addiction, but then the studies that I ran weren't? Well, I mean, I guess one possibility is we ran terrible studies or something, I don't know. Um, I don't think that's the case. There's one possibility is that the studies that found a difference were individual therapy uh, the ones that I ran were group therapy. Maybe there's something specifically healing about being in a group that uh, helps people to make a connection. And in fact, on that one study, uh, we reanalyzed the data on that uh, first study that I showed you um, where we did the relaxation and such. And we found actually that the group composition did matter. That uh, when, um, oh, let's see if I can get this data correctly. Uh, when the, there were men in the group, so we looked at how did the men do? You know, well, when there were more men in the group, they didn't have as much empathy for their offender. It was almost as if, and this is what we hypothesized, we couldn't test it with the data we had, but we hypothesized maybe there's something about, if I'm in a group of men or more men in this group, I'm not quite as willing to be empathic and softer. Social, uh, socialization, gender roles would, would tell me that I need to be strong and rough and maybe even be a little angry and vengeful. Um, and what we found with women, though, was opposite. When there were more men in their group, they actually forgave more. So we thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe what's going on there is, and we actually looked at this data, most of the women that were in our groups were hurt by 
men. And so maybe it was the fact that they had these people in the group who were their peers that they could interact with a little bit. And they could actually see, hey, these guys are pretty sensitive and maybe men aren't terrible or they aren't all hurtful. And, and maybe that helped them to develop more empathy. We're not sure. Again, it was correlational, but uh, it made us wonder that maybe there's something that's happening individual versus group, um, that maybe in an individual format, it's better just to do these forgiveness interventions. Maybe with the group, it doesn't matter quite as much. I'm not so sure. I'm just trying to be fair. So we're going to look at all the options, but then I'm going to tell you the one I really think. OK, um, perhaps it's uh, time spent intervening. The individual treatments were done in a much longer format. Uh, they, they spent a lot more time. The treatments that I ran were shorter in duration. And so perhaps what's happening is you're actually seeing, you know, maybe, maybe if we could have kept our groups going, we would have seen them diverge over more therapy. So if we gave them more therapy, maybe the forgiveness would have had more of a time to really work better than the alternative group. Uh, there were some sample differences. So you know, who made up the specific samples? In our gr groups, we tend to make them more uh, heterogeneous, more eclectic. We open the doors up and pretty much say, if you've got a hurt, you know that list I showed you? If you fit that list, you can come in. With the other two studies, they're very specific. So they looked at only women who were you know, dealing with emotional abuse from a spouse, and they had been out of the relationship for two years. That's a very specific group. The alcohol and drug group, likewise, uh, more specific problem that they're dealing with. Lastly, and this is the one I really think it is, and we're testing this in the current study, um, I think that there's a lot going on with allegiance effects. So if you look at my studies, the studies that I've run, um, we've worked really hard to not have me run any, of this run any of the groups, not have any of my direct graduate students running any of the groups, um, so that there's not a allegiance to the forgiveness treatment that we're testing that we're developing, that we're working on. We've worked really hard to do that. So what we've done is we bring in therapists and we train them in our method, just like some of you who are therapists perhaps uh, would maybe want to be trained in a new therapy. So you know, maybe you don't have a whole lot of allegiance, especially not like a researcher who's developed this thing. Um, and so, but can you be trained and effective? Well, that's what we want to know. Can we train therapists and help them to be effective? And then we also train them in these alternatives the way they would be trained uh, in their regular treatment programs or uh, training programs. In the other studies, um, the, the researchers themselves are running the studies. Um, so the, the authors are actually, uh, if you read between the lines, are actually the ones that are uh, running the studies. So I kind of think there might be something with the fact that they're elite. And there's some really good research by a guy named Bruce Wampold out of, again, also uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, who's talked about common factors in psychotherapy. And one of the things that he identifies is that allegiance effects account for a pretty large chunk, more so than any studies have shown with individual specific, any one specific ingredient for an intervention, um, like, uh, for example, a specific forgiveness kind of intervention. And so uh, these allegiance effects, I think, are an important part of it. So. Before I get to the study that tries to address this, some of these allegiance effects and some of these other things, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we're currently doing. And I don't have any data to bore you with, so uh, that'll be quick. But I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, in the little bit of time we have left, what is the state of the knowledge currently with uh, these forgiveness interventions, forgiveness therapy? So what's known? Well, there's a few things that are, I would say, are, are fairly well known. Um, one is that interventions to promote forgi forgiveness help people. Okay, So they do help people. They help people increase forgiveness. Um, you know, whether they're uh, general alternative treatments or whether they're specific interventions, if you look at those specific interventions, they're helping people. Very few studies show no effects. There's a couple studies that have been done in like one hour seminars or two hour seminars. It's kind of like, okay, so they don't show an effect, but very little therapy in one or two sessions is gonna show an effect. But if you get them up to just six hours, six hours with people, they're showing some pretty good effects and they help people to increase forgiveness. They also help people to reduce psychological symptoms. So I talked about depression, talked about uh, anxiety and some other things, that brief symptom inventory, those are others. Um, they seem to help people also to deal with the psychological symptoms that often bring people to therapy. They also increase or seem to increase hope and well-being. So that's been measured as well. What else is known? Well, they help for a wide range of offenses. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we've seen has been uh, romantic rejection, romantic betrayals, a lot of sexual infidelity. Um, so there's been even sexual and physical abuse has been done. The, one of the studies by uh, Bob Enright, one of Bob Enright's study, uh, students, she worked with uh, um, 12 
individuals who had all experienced uh, sexual abuse as a child. And, um, you know, it's, again, it's one of these, like the, the genocide one, it's so powerful to think about, you're, really, you're going to go in there, you're going to talk about forgiveness. All right. Well, and she did this, and these people have life-changing stories as a result of this study that she ran. Now, one of the interesting things is, um, of course, is that she spent a long time with them. This isn't a six-hour treatment that you go in and you say, okay, I'm going to teach you what forgiveness is, and at the end of six sessions, you're going to be good to go. Um, the average treatment in this case was 14 months, and some lasted upwards of three years. And so she was really working with these women through the program, and they all were able to go through their program in their own, uh, at their own pace. Um, again, even for murder and genocide, the forgiveness uh, uh, studies have been done on that, uh, and they seem to help people to move beyond uh, some of this work, uh, or some of those hurts. What else is known? Well, they work in various modalities. I've already talked to you about this. Individual, family and couples, group, the community-based ones. Uh, each of these have, been, have examples of how they've been effective for helping people uh, to move beyond the hurt. Um, I think this is also known that they're really not for everyone. So I've been trying to, to maybe it's a bit of a subtext. So I'm going to make it explicit today. I think this is also an important part of the, the talk is that, and any time I talk about the forgiveness therapy, I think it's important to put in. They're not necessarily for everybody. There's many people, for example, that I said earlier where people come in and say, no, I don't, I don't want it. Um, so there's a whole informed consent, of course, that goes into therapy. Uh, you don't want to be putting on people through work that they don't want to do or, or shooting for goals that they don't personally have. Um, so that, that's something. Um, some of the, the sample restrictions that we talked about, you know, again, uh, with uh, certain people um, who, again, either uh, don't want it, aren't ready for it, those are the kinds of things uh, that, that can play a part. Um, there's a really interesting, uh, some interesting work that was done in 2005 um, by uh, uh, Sharon Lamb, I think. Her name, last name's Lamb. I think it's Sharon Lamb. Um, where she's kind of in response to some of that first decade of forgiveness research, put out a couple of papers where she was like, whoa, like hold the phone here, you know, let's be careful, let's not get too exuberant about this uh, forgiveness stuff. And she put together, I think, what I think is a fair argument about being very cautious as therapists um, and, and researchers as well about talking about forgiveness with people who come from traditionally oppressed groups. Um, she's talked about primarily, uh, she was talking about uh, for women who were abused at the hands of men. Again, in our culture where women don't have typically or traditionally have not had as much power as men, it gets complicated. It gets interesting when you start talking about you know, forgiveness. And, and I think part of her argument is fair, and I think part of her argument is a misunderstanding, perhaps, of forgiveness and the way in which forgiveness therapy happens. Because uh, the ther forgiveness therapists, therapists who do forgiveness therapy that I know, uh, would never talk about you know the shoulds or the musts of forgiveness. You, know, like, you gotta go forgive this guy or whatever. It's it's all um, very much with what the client wants. Um, but there is kind of an interesting point. And then you broaden it to racial groups in our country or other countries, um, and you start talking about well, if you're from the minority group and you come to a minority group and then you're talking about you should forgive or or you could forgive, it kind of has this subtext of you should forgive, even if you don't maybe say should. And, and so there becomes this really complicated situation about um, how you deal with forgiveness in that situation. So I think with this one, um, I think it's often richer, and this is what happened in Rwanda, when someone who maybe has some forgiveness expertise can come in and train someone in the community, train someone from that perspective who then can talk in a much more culturally sensitive way to people who are in that culture with them. Um, and then I think forgiveness can be very rich and can be uh, very useful. Um, so just some, some ideas there with what it may not be useful for. So what's not known? Well, these are some things that aren't known, at least that I would say. Uh, some of the causal mechanisms of the treatment. So I think it's real easy to, to, to fall into the trap of saying, well, there's a study that's been done that shows that this forgiveness treatment helps people get better, and then to assume that it was that treatment that got people better. So some really great work that's uh, happened, oh, I don't know, it's been developing probably for decades, but has really uh, come to the fore more in the last, say, 10 to 15 years in the psychotherapy research area uh, about this idea of common factors, that um, it's maybe not so much about the specific interventions that you do, but the things that are common across the psychotherapies. Uh, for example, a strong therapeutic alliance with a caring professional who can understand and be empathic to your problems. 
Now, if they turn that into a psychodynamic intervention or they turn it into a CBT intervention or they come back you with some humanistic thing, which crazy, that's what I do, um, you know, then uh, it seems to be helpful. So it's not so much about the specifics. So then I've kind of brought this into my work and just try to say, well, how much are the, the causal, the, the common factors causing this benefit for, for uh, forgiveness, and how much is it uh, the specific kinds of interventions? What we say is kind of the theory of what works uh, to help people forgive. I've got some real questions about that, and I don't know that that has been answered yet. Um, so even if we could begin to get at some of the causal uh, mechanisms of what helping people forgive, uh, I think there's some questions still about what are some of the specific elements that work best. So trying to understand you know, okay, well, we're showing that a general process therapy group helps people get better, but is that helping people the most? Or is the intervention, the forgiveness interventions that we do that are more specific, might those be more effective? Also, uh, this question of for whom the uh, various treatments work best. That is often a much later question to be asked, but it's one of the questions that we're starting to ask is, well, okay, so, quote, they work, is only goes so far. You know, it goes about as far as you know, two steps. And then you have to say, all right, do you mean for everybody? You know, and so it really brings up this other question of like, okay, well, who are they helpful for? And, and in what circumstances, in what situations are they most helpful? These are the kind of things that, that there really is nothing um, uh, out there that gives us good answers to these questions. Okay, so this is the, you see here, your status bar is almost full. You're almost completely downloaded. Um, an overview of some of my current research. I just wanted to give you a flavor for what I'm doing. Um, I was funded by the Fetzer Institute with a really generous grant from them um, to do this study, which has been really great uh, to be able to, to answer some of the questions uh, that I've been wanting to ask but really haven't had the resources to, to run the research. So it's been very exciting this last uh, six months or so. Um, some of the main questions and hypotheses that we're uh, going to test in this, uh, we're going to run a clinical trial of forgiveness treatment. We have a comparison of treatments, and so we've uh, expanded our forgiveness treatment and made it a, a longer treatment. We're gonna, it's, uh, it's still a, a relatively short-term treatment. It's eight sessions, uh, an hour and a half each, so uh, they will be getting uh, uh, that in a specific forgiveness intervention, and then we're gonna do that uh, a, a general process group again. And we're gonna test this, basically expanding our pilot study, making it a lot bigger, getting a lot more numbers in to find out, okay, where are our results? Uh, a result of what's really happening out there or maybe more just affect that small sample that we had. Another thing that we're looking at that's is new in forgiveness is attachment style. So one of the questions that I had, which I thought was uh, um, interesting to me anyway, uh, about who might benefit from forgiveness therapy would be uh, attachment style. Now, I'll try to spare you the details on attachment theory, which is a huge, great literature um, in psychotherapy and in psychology in general. Um, but in general, it has the idea of uh, what is my pattern for the ways in which I connect to other people and understand my interpersonal relationships and work in close relationships. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking at is adult attachment style, and we're gonna be looking at the uh, avoidant continuum and the uh, anxiety continuum. Um, so do I anxiously attach, which has a lot of very specific uh, behavior kind of patterns and emotional patterns? Do I avoidantly attach, or do I have more of what's called a kind of a secure attachment, which is kind of the, the absence of both avoidance and uh, anxiety? And so my thought is, is that there's gonna be something there that uh, the ways in which people attach is gonna have an impact. That I, I believe that people who have more secure kinds of attachments are gonna respond more favorably to our treatment in general. However, remember we're doing, I do group stuff. And so I think that the group is actually gonna have an impact on that. So that if someone who doesn't have typically a normal, um, uh, not normal, a secure kind of attachment to individuals, that if they can get into a group that's strong and cohesive, that they feel connected to and that feels connected to them, I think that'll override their attachment style. And so we're gonna look at things like group cohesion as well, and that's the third kind of set of hypotheses in this study, is to examine what happens within this particular group, does that help me to forgive? So maybe not about at all about what the therapist tells me about forgiveness or, or makes me work through, and you know, we have some cool interventions where we do some, you know, uh, empty chair work, and we do some apology work, and we do some other thing. Maybe it's not about that. Maybe it's just about the fact that I feel connected to this group of people. I know they love me. I love them, and 
I'm at home here. And that helps me to let go of my burden, let go of my pain, and to move on from this hurt that's been uh, uh, burdening me for so long. Those are some of the questions that we're going to ask. Um, I'll spare you the details on the procedure, but perhaps in a few years I'll come back and tell you what happened. So that's what I have for today, and uh, we can open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, I think they'd like you to step up to the mic because they are recording this. Yeah, I want to look. I'm not a psychologist. <clears throat> I've been helped previously in life by a very good psychotherapist in, in California. So I just want to say I'm not against the empirical studies. I'm not, uh, on the other hand, since it's Wheaton and you're a Christian, I do want to bring up the obvious theological aspect because I'm mainly interested in theology, mm -hmm. theology, philosophy, interaction with psychology and so on. And I know that it's a very a specific setting here that you're yeah. dealing with fellow researchers and so on. But I'm just wondering even practically how the obvious connection to the forgiveness that we receive, the Lord's Prayer, et cetera, mm -hmm. to, and I'm assuming you believe strongly that this is the ultimate forgiveness, and even for me it's the connection. I, I'm able to better forgive when I make that connection mm -hmm. vertically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's obviously theologically um, a, a straight, I think. But, do you see this in the therapy? I know you, in your secular setting, you probably mm -hmm. can't introduce mm -hmm. any form of pre-evangelism or so on, but yeah. do you see that connection in our Christian, at least post-Christian culture, uh, of that obvious theological connection? Yeah. Uh, did I make myself Thanks, clear? Thanks, you sure did. Like, yep. Good question, and I think very appropriate for, uh, uh, for the intent of this lecture. Um, so, first off to say, uh, I don't do a lot of research in this area, so uh, in some ways I'm talking almost as a layperson, but I'll give it my best shot and uh, we can you know, see where that leads us. Um, so uh, there's one study that I did do where we looked at one of, these, one of these other studies that I put up here. We took the data and we reanalyzed it because we do typically ask for religious affiliation, we typically ask for religious commitment, and we also ask for uh, the person's self-rated tendency to forgive, what we call trait forgivingness. So it's What's your disposition to forgive in general across situations? I didn't talk about any of that data here, but uh, we did uh, run a study then where we tried to predict, okay, well, does you know, being Christian versus not Christian, does that have an impact? Or being committed to one's Christianity, does that have an impact on the way in which some, someone forgives? Um, and what we found is that uh, direct relationship between uh, uh, religious commitment and one of the forgiveness kinds of measures that we have, which is empathy, uh, so feeling more empathic towards the offender, what we found is that there is a general relationship that way. So uh, people who report that they're religious, that they're more committed to their religion, tend to be more empathic towards the offender than people who don't. And we actually found that that relationship seemed to be what's, uh, what's called mediated by trait forgiveness, that, that somehow the, the religious commitment seems to be related to trait forgivingness, and that accounts for this more empathy. So something about being more committed to one's religion tends to give you more of a forgiving disposition, and then in a specific situation you become more forgiving. Um, now again, the, the drawback to that research is that it's all self-report, um, but in terms of just the broader idea, um, there was an interesting study that was done, and this was done in a secular setting um, by a colleague of mine named Mark Rye. And uh, he brought in people and, uh, at Bowling Green State University, and he, his first study, he did two studies. The first one was with uh, college students, women who had been hurt by a romantic partner. And he put them into a forgiveness treatment that was your typical kind of secular setting, secular intervention, just about forgiveness, but no spiritual or religious elements. And the other one was infused with Christian imagery for forgiveness. And he actually found that the two treatments, there was no difference, which kind of shocked him. So he, he ended up running this study again, doing a very similar thing with people in the community uh, and people who had suffered from divorce. He did the same thing. He put, you know, people, he, again, they all consented to be willing to kind of either do a religious one or not. And they went into the study. No differences between the two. Well, what he did then is he went back to the data and he really dug into some of the more qualitative kind of data, the, the written descriptions that people had given about their treatments. And he had asked them a question, what did you do to help forgive? And he found that in equal, with equal frequency, people in both groups wrote 
spiritually and uh, uh, religiously related things. So seeking God's help and uh, praying to God and praying for my offender and, you know, doing meditations and these things that were in, in part of the one study, but people who were in the second were just spontaneously doing that themselves. So he was kind of like, well, we don't really know. People are doing this stuff. And it seems to be something very important to many people. Um, and then one more point, and we'll open it up for more questions. Um, I, I had an honors undergrad student who was interested in this area of religion and forgiveness. And so she ran a great project where she brought in uh, uh, 10 people from the community. We've advertised for individuals who had been hurt significantly in their life but had already forgiven, which isn't typical. I usually bring people in who haven't forgiven yet. But she wanted to, to deal with people who had forgiven because she wanted to know how has your religion helped you with this? And so we just, we did a qualitative study where we asked people about this and had them, you know, uh, complete interviews uh, related to this question. And, uh, and we brought in people from various uh, religious backgrounds. So we had most, I think half of our sample was Christian. Then we had uh, Buddhists and two uh, Muslims and a, a Jewish individual. And so, um, and talking from their own traditions about how does your tradition help you with forgiveness? And, you know, as a Christian tradition, people are talking about the kinds of things that you said, you know, the Lord's Prayer and being in sermons and hearing, you know, their ministers talk about forgiveness and thinking and reflecting. I mean, that's a powerful experience. Think about that. You're sitting in your, you know, your service and you're, you know you've got this thing on your back you've carried for years and you hear the pastor, you know, you're, you're bound to reflect on this thing. What do I do with this? So many people were saying, yes, this was very important to help move them towards forgiveness. Great. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for presenting this in such a fun and uh, thorough way. So thank, thank you. you. I have two questions. Yeah. The first is, have you found any um, differentiation in the research on trauma versus someone being badly hurt as far as what forgiveness requires? Mm -hmm. And then if you could give like a clinical example of a good outcome study of the second part of your definition where someone has um, a um, a change in the personal attitudes and feelings about the offending person, kind of clinically what that would look like. Okay. Um, that would be great. Thank okay. you. All right. So uh, the first part was, uh, remind me again, the first question. Is there any differentiation Trauma. in okay. if someone's been traumatized okay. versus badly hurt in the forgiveness right. literature? Yeah. Um, most of the studies have been done with people who have been traumatized, uh, that have more those severe hurts, are typically done specifically for that. So the, the one study that I told you about with the incest survivors, it was, they were only looking for incest survivors and that's all they looked at. And they didn't have a study where they compared. So there's, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, any empirical research that's looked at specifically comparing people who have, you know, within the same study, who've dealt with more, you know, very severe things with, you know, not as severe things. Uh, there hasn't been that I'm aware of, or at least not thinking of right now. Um, some of the work that we do, though, because it's more of this heterogeneous groups, um, we do, we have been able to look at, uh, you know, severity of the offense. And what I've just been shocked with, really, is that the, there's no difference in, in even their pre-treatment ratings. So these, you know, many people who come in, you know, it's kind of like that subjective experience. It's like, if this is my hurt, it hurts. And if this is the one I think about and this is the one I share, even if it happens to be, you know, a, a girlfriend broke up with me in high school and I didn't think it was very fair versus I got abused as a kid, we can look at that from the outside and say, wow. But the person who's in there, if that's the one they pick, typically in our study, uh, in the way we do our studies, they are just as severe from their subjective experience as the other. Um, now, most of the time in the previous studies we've done, we haven't brought in people who have dealt with the, the most severe kinds of uh, sexual abuse and that sort of thing. In this current study, we're bringing those individuals in. We're actually getting more of that uh, than these other kinds of everyday hurts. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how some of our results change. But, um, you know, I think, you know, I alluded to the fact that, of course, time is something that has been found that, you know, in my looking at the research, that that certainly has an impact on it, that you can have a lot of impact with someone in a short amount of time who hasn't dealt with something that goes as far back as childhood and, and isn't as entrenched or isn't as close to their heart and soul as uh, some of the other ones. Um, other kinds of things, I don't know, I think it's still a, an open question. Um, and then in terms of the uh, particular paper that would help you to 
uh, know about some of the clinical interventions. Was that what you were wondering? If you could just give an outcome study of someone who uh, exemplifies the second part of your definition of forgiveness. Oh, how people but, promote. Right. Let's say someone that's been raped. Um, what about that second part? The most of these studies, most of the studies that I put up that we do, we're always testing that that kind of pro-social feeling towards the event. So we'll we'll look at empathy. Uh, we'll look at um, uh, other kinds of variables like compassion, sympathy, those kinds of things that that are being promoted. So it's not just about are you angry anymore or not? But it's about how do you feel more positively towards this person. So all my studies would do that. Um, the one that I was alluding to was uh, by Friedman and Enright. That's the uh, incest survivors from an individual therapy perspective. That measure that they used has both reducing these negative elements of anger, bitterness, revenge, desires, but also all the positive stuff as well. And so when they look and when they say these people improve, it actually has to do with you know the positive elements as well. So. Good, thank you. Other questions? Do you find that the uh, people who choose not to forgive, have you done any studies that at some later point mm. in their lives they get back into therapy and change position? Is there any longitudinal study there? That's a great, great question. And unfortunately, there's not. Um, the, the longest, well, the longest longitudinal study that I know of is one that we did where we went back two years later and uh, that one, the one study that I gave you some of the details on and showed you some of the results from the pilot study, we actually went back, I think it was two to two and a half years later, and uh, had them respond and let us know about the treatments and those sort of things. Um, but again, those were mostly people who had already forgiven. So in terms of uh, tracking people who hadn't forgiven or maybe people who came into our study and then said, I don't really want to forgive, there's been nothing that we've seen. You know, most of the studies only follow people anyway for four months or you know, two months after the treatment, um, which is a real drawback. But so, in terms of the clinical studies, there's there's not a lot of longitudinal stuff. Anybody else? Well, let me thank you again for your warm invitation and for this opportunity to come and share my work. Thank you. For information on this or other video programming from Wheaton College, please call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A guide to WETN video programming is available at wetn.org.